Rob Winkler. I am actually now the Magic Board Vice President. Um, and today we are pleased to have uh, Ashley Hitt from Connected Nation. She is a GISP. She is the Vice President of GIS Services at Connected Nation. Uh, they are a national leader in broadband expansion programs. Ashley oversees operations of the GIS services and engineering and technical services teams, developing methodologies for using broadband data to provide solutions that impact policy, economic development, and the digital divide. Ashley was also the conference chair for ERISA GIS Pro 2020. Uh, and she's also an instructor for the URSA GIS Leadership Academy. So she's got a lot of credentials. We're really, we're really happy to have her here today. And uh, uh, let's go ahead and without further ado, um, Ashley, take it away, please. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rob. I'm going to go ahead and share a presentation screen. And Rob, if you could just confirm you can see everything there. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. All right. So uh, the presentation we're going to give today is on uh, broadband mapping advocacy uh, to increase citizen engagement, because certainly as a lot of the uh, applications and things that we put together as GIS professionals require the internet, whether it's, you know, a browser based information, whether we're sharing data, open data, uh, applications on mobile devices and tablets that internet or broadband connection is vital to be able to share and get information, uh, making that two-way uh, transfer of information, data, feedback, crowdsourced information, all of that relies on broadband services. And so what Connected Nation does is we focus our mission solely on the expansion of broadband and related technologies. Um, I've been uh, at Connected Nation for almost 14 years now. And so we have continued that mission. And certainly with this year, as, as Rob mentioned, you know, you guys have your virtual showcase started with the pandemic as well. And so it has really highlighted the issue of the digital divide and how many areas don't have broadband service. Um, and so I want to review some of that today, just go through uh, what some of those issues are, what data sets exist, what are some of the issues, and then how we are working with communities and states to try and fix that. So uh, just a quick outline, just talk a little bit more about the digital divide, what exactly that entails, uh, some broadband mapping, looking at data set challenges, like I mentioned, um, would say why is this important? I used to put that in presentations because I would get to, to areas and, and people wouldn't realize that there are people that do not have internet at, at home. Like it either physically is not an option for them. They can't sign up. They can't call a provider and say, hook me up with cable or telephone. It physically does not exist. Um, and so that used to be an issue, but now certainly with the pandemic and teleworking becoming uh, very widespread, the NTI or the non-traditional learning for students to have to do that work at home that has certainly raised the issue as well. So why is this important has become certainly front and center. Uh, also wanna review some of the state success stories. What are things that states and communities have done to uh, not just identify the issue, but to address it as well. And then I wanna talk a little bit about advocacy and legislative items. What are things that both state and federal uh, are doing to help identify, again, identify the issue as well as close the digital divide. And then uh, just real quick, some additional programs that Connected Nation has. Um, obviously, us as GIS professionals in, in the geospatial field, we have um, certain parts that we're more interested in in terms of the data. But what are some of the other programs and things that uh, Connected Nation does um, just as, as far as increasing that broadband access and its related technologies? What's the and related technologies part? So. Uh, just a quick overview of that and then certainly open for um, Q&A at the end there. So with the digital divide, uh, right now the FCC has been measuring this. Their most recent report says about 18 million Americans do not have broadband access. Um, there have been multiple uh, reports and studies to try and really measure what that gap is. And is it truly 18 million? Is it more than that? Uh, what and then where exactly are those people located? We certainly can't fix a problem we haven't been able to measure accurately. So that's definitely one of the big issues there. 
14 million of those 18 millions are in rural areas. So while there is a, typically a difference between urban and rural access of broadband availability, there are still urban areas. Um, I live in Louisville, Kentucky, and there are parts of my city that do not have internet access or they do not have what's considered broadband access. Um, so we're looking at a, a minimum speed to be considered broadband or high speed. And there are parts of Louisville's metro area within the county that do not meet that. So when we start to look at things like telework and telehealth and uh, education and kids learning from home, that's where that really starts to become a problem. Um, and talking about that, uh, you know, 15% or so of households with school-aged children do not have broadband. Um, and so calling that the homework gap uh, pre-pandemic certainly, but now it's not just the homework gap. It's not just that kids can't do their homework online or do research or submit um, items to teachers and have that two-way communication. Now it's literally zero education at home. So it's not just the homework gap anymore, but still a very important part of uh, what we're trying to help fix. Uh, so when we start talking about broadband mapping, there are two distinct parts that um, I wanted to kind of highlight here. The map on the left reflects what's called last mile broadband. And so that looks at the connection physically into your home or your office or a business. Um, where is that service available and what's that service area look like? Uh, whereas on the right, that picture is actually looking at middle mile broadband. And that's literally the interconnection from, you know, after the line goes out of your house, what does it actually connect to to get to the internet? Um, and so we certainly need both. Um, today's presentation is going to focus more on the last mile broadband, where is residential access to those services, and how are those mapped, what are the things that are analyzed, uh, whereas the middle mile broadband, um, obviously essential because in order to expand last mile, you have to have that middle mile first, you have to have that backhaul um, to be able to connect into that and have the connections that are necessary to um, reach the internet access that each person is trying to get across the country. So some of the data set challenges that exist, uh, right now the FCC has what's called the Form 477. And that is a filing that providers are supposed to submit twice a year that highlights what census blocks across the whole country do they have service in and what type of technology is in those census blocks as well as the maximum speeds, both download and upload. And that information is currently the, the best national data set available. Um, so they, they have a broadband map available. Uh, the link is uh, on the slide right now that shows, you know, you can type in, type in an address, see a list of providers at that location. You can download data um, and process it and bring it into your own systems. Um, however, it's not adequate for local planning. Um, broadband networks are very independent of census block boundaries. And so there are certainly inherent issues with using that as kind of the, the level of aggregation. And uh, so when you start to get more at the local level, the more issues you start to see. Um, as you know, if you work frequently with census blocks, you know that in more rural areas, those census blocks get larger and larger. And so, if you're reporting services available in a very large census block, some of which can be you know, as large as the state of Connecticut, and you're trying to figure out what parts of that census block actually have service, the Form 477 data is not adequate enough for that local planning. Um, so I'll pick up this topic a little bit later in the presentation, just in terms of what the FCC and Congress are doing to help fix that, to make a better data set um, available in the future. But some of the other primary challenges that exist with the data set, uh, not all providers are actually filing this form. They're supposed to, it's a mandatory form, but there are um, some, uh, there has been some lag in the number of providers that are filing that. Uh, not all providers have GIS capabilities. Um, so this actually, this still kind of sounds a little funny when you think about how location-based a telecom system or a telecom network is, it's all about the routes and the ground, where are the customers, where are my potential customers that they can market to even. But we have found in the work that we've done in states across the country that 
there are a lot of providers that do not have GIS and the resources to be able to put together location-based files to show where is their network, where are the houses that they can serve, um, and other types of information. So the fixed broadband data itself ends up being filed as a CSV file. And so it just contains the census block codes, um, some codes for the type of technology, the speed information, and uh, the provider's uh, naming identification as well. So that data is only as a CSV. It's not in a geospatial format when it's filed. And so that has also lent itself towards some issues. Uh, providers aren't actually seeing a map of what they're filing. They're just filing a series of codes and census block IDs, but without that visual component, they may not be able to see and, and go, oh, you know, this isn't quite accurate. Um, you know, we need to change this. This extends too far. Whatever those issues might be, uh, that level of visualization is not currently there. Another issue is that fixed wireless services are also filed as census block list. And um, we'll see some examples in a little bit, but um, if you've seen some of the maps that um, mobile carriers file and, or have advertised, they are, or they're showing a footprint of where their signal can physically reach. And fixed wireless is the same way. It's a service that you can get at your house, but we need to know where that signal is located. And that, again, does not follow census block boundaries, so it tends to be overstated. And we'll see some examples of that in a little bit as well. Uh, certainly, as we mentioned, inherent overstatement just by using census blocks, because if it's a partially served block, but the FCC considers blocks either, bi they're binary, they're either served or they're unserved at this point. And so, having that inherent overstatement, where is the actual boundary of the broadband service area, that using census blocks as the unit of measure has definitely had some issues there. We also have some understatement issues because of missing provider data, whether that's because a provider is not filing their information with the FCC or they haven't done that visual component of seeing what, what do these census blocks look like on a map to know if there is anything missing. So we've seen that quite a bit in the data as well. The data can be old by the time it's published. Um, right now, the current data set is from December of 2019. Uh, so certainly we're, we're looking at what was broadband a year ago um, instead of a little bit more current. Uh, that filing is every six months. And then the FCC process, processes that information, makes some corrections, and then they make that public as well. So uh, unfortunately, there's a little bit of a lag in terms of when that data is published and how current it is. Um, and then one of the other things that we've seen is that the provider submitted data is not thoroughly validated. Um, so again, some of the issues that we've discussed already, but then uh, making sure that there are engineers and others going out into the field and confirming the presence of a system, uh, making sure that providers that are missing are represented on the map as well, um, because that has a huge impact towards funding opportunities that I'll talk a little bit about in a minute here. Uh, so just a few visuals to kind of see exactly where some of these problems lie. Uh, so in this example, we're looking at a provider, let's say they have a cable franchise agreement with a town or a city and any location, any household within that town, if they call, they will provide service or they have already built out service to all the locations in that town. But as we know, census blocks do not always line up with those town boundaries. And so uh, if the left side is the true visualization of what that service area is, the one on the right is the census block representation that would get filed with the FCC. And so we can see there's a lot of overstatement there with people who are not actually served, but would be showing up as served according to the FCC data at this point. Uh, another example is if you've got a provider that knows exactly which streets they offer service on, if they know they can serve any of these houses uh, within this boundary, and then again, converting that to census block level, the amount of overstatement that exists. So if, again, if you're in one of those areas, you're getting counted as served when you actually don't have service from that provider. And then one more example, uh, this is on the fixed wireless side. Um, our engineers create what are called propagations so that if you see some of the, the towers that are available, the equipment that's on them, uh, the type of frequency that they use to broadcast their signal, we can take that and uh, several other parameters to create 
this visualization or footprint of where that fixed wireless signal can actually reach. Um, and it's very detailed and very granular. And then again, if you grab the census blocks that have some level of service within them for that filing, you're very much again overstating what's actually available. Uh, next couple slides I've got some examples of real 477 data that we've pulled and then worked with that provider to refine what their service area actually looks like. So the image on the left is the original 477 data. Those are the census blocks that this provider filed with the FCC. And then the middle coverage in green, we actually worked with the provider said, all right, let's, let's not look at census blocks, but where are the areas where you can physically build out service to, or you can connect someone that calls. And so the green is their actual or their granular service area. And then if we were to grab the appropriate census blocks based on that, the image on the far right is what should have been filed. And so comparing, you can start to see there where some census blocks filed where they didn't actually have service and then some where they do have service, but were missing. And, and so that overstatement and understatement can exist on many levels. And then one more example, this one's always very interesting to me because we've seen it multiple times. Uh, this is an example of a fixed wireless provider where their billing system said, oh, we can handle the Form 477 filing for you. And it turns out that that's not quite accurate because this example only covered census blocks where they had a current customer. And so that was not reflective of their actual service area where if somebody calls within that, they can hook them up. So. Uh, the green in the middle, again, we worked with them to get their tower information, where do they have services, um, where can their signal reach and created that coverage area. And then what under the current rules, what should their 477 filing have looked like? What census blocks do they actually have at least some level of service in? So we see quite a number of examples where this has been an issue, both understatement, overstatement, the inaccuracy that exists, and then trying to move forward to make it better. Uh, this one is an example from uh, work that we did where we actually compared engineering data on the ground to uh, what the FCC had been publishing. And so looking at Walton County, Florida, um, I've got a, a zoom in here in a second, but the, the gold or orange areas are from the 477 data. Those are the, the census blocks that are listed as uh, served. And then as we zoom in here, we can start to see the purple is actually where we validated and confirmed the presence of broadband service. Um, and so that was obviously a, a huge difference. We've got a considerable amount of overstatement uh, where the orange or the gold color is showing up and where we act, compared to where we actually found infrastructure to exist. Um, and so this isn't just a a small provider issue where perhaps a, a small broadband provider may not have GIS resources or somebody who can handle uh, developing that network file for them. This also exists um, in some of the larger carriers as well. Um, I'm not going to name any names, um, but we did see in this case uh, in particular in Walton County where the FCC data had listed um, a specific provider available in this county we found no evidence of that service being available, contacted that provider and, and inquired about it. And then we're told, oh, you know, we don't have actual service in that county. Um, and so we actually notified them that there were some mistakes in the filing uh, based on the information we had seen. And so um, hopefully they were able to use that information to uh, correct their filing as well. Um, but that's the level of detail that some of these projects have been able to get to as far as um, where is the broadband service? What's the ground truth? Um, and so that's from an engineering perspective, um, but there's also a component of crowdsourced information and public feedback. So um, if we're doing a project in an area or a state is collecting information, we, we want people to tell us where are the maps wrong. So if we publish uh, a set of maps we, or an interactive map, we uh, also have a, a web form and then other ways to contact because certainly if uh, it does sound ironic. Here's a, here's a web form to tell us that you don't have the internet. Um, so we do have other ways to con get in contact with us. Let us know that uh, your household does not have broadband access 
so that we can compare that to the map and ensure that it's accurate. So the areas that are truly unserved or underserved, they may have internet, but it may not be high speed. Um, so we want to track that information. And so crowdsourcing is definitely a huge part of that as well. Um, so again, why is this important? Um, certainly this year has really enhanced that answer. Um, before this happened with the pandemic, certainly we were talking about precision agriculture. Uh, again, the homework gap, which has certainly turned into uh, a much higher level of educational opportunities. Uh, employment and digital literacy. How do we get more people to perhaps telework if they are not able to go to a workplace, um, if they are immunocompromised, if they have some type of disability that keeps them from moving about um, and getting to an office space? Uh, how do we allow more people employment opportunities and digital literacy to be able to have those jobs that they can do from home? Um, E-government, uh, when we have our different agencies who are trying to you know, re renew driver's licenses and car tags and um, fill out certain forms. And a lot of that's done online now. You need to have the internet to be able to do so. Um, economic development. I know there are uh, certainly economic development opportunities and agencies across all the states, local, uh, local and state-based, but um, how do we look at economic development opportunities? How can we um, get a data center to attract a data center to our community if our area doesn't have sufficient internet access. Um, so that's another reason why this has been important. Uh, certainly that citizen engagement, if you've created apps for your agency or your organization that you want people to use, that internet access becomes a, a huge part of that. We don't want to create things that pe our people or our public can't use. Um, so making sure that that internet access is available. Uh, telehealth, which has obviously seen some huge increases as well. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit as well. And then certainly the COVID-19 response um, and just the, the huge amount of importance that has been put on broadband and internet access itself. Um, so now I wanna get into some of the uh, state-based programs, some of the state successes that we've seen, um, starting with Texas. Um, so as we've seen, there are layers of inac uh, inadequacy with the current federal data set. And so when uh, we work with a state to create better or more granular broadband maps, we are working on a basically a four pronged approach. Uh, first thing we do is reach out to all of the broadband providers across the state, establish relationships with them, uh, non-disclosure agreements so that they can share information with us that may be confidential um, or you know, whether it's in the public domain or something that they have that is they do not want out there, um, working to get that information to derive a service area. Uh, the second is gonna be just independent research, um, having our engineers and uh, provider relations teams doing additional research, finding out where licenses are available, where different uh, frequencies are used for different providers so that we have a better indication of where services are available by speed, by technology, et cetera. Uh, the third component is going to be field validation. Uh, so like what I showed with uh, the Walton County, Florida information, having engineers on the ground, looking for and tracking that infrastructure in a collector app so that we know exactly where those services are available as well as the assets, uh, whether that is um, fiber nodes, cabinets, uh, copper lines, um, anything that kind of falls within that uh, perspective. And then the fourth is going to be resident feedback, getting the local information from the people who live there who say, you know, hey, the map says I have three different providers, but I called two of them and they said they can't serve me. And we use that feedback to then refine and make uh, the maps more accurate for the next release. Um, so what we're looking at here for Texas, this is just a, an example of a county map uh, looking at what broadband information is available? What are those service areas like in this particular county? And in this case, we have it split between two different colors. Uh, the darker green is actually showing where we have more detailed data available on the service area. We have more confidence that all the locations within it are actually served by broadband. And then the lighter green is reflective of the FCC or the federal data that's available in, for that provider. So when we work to establish those relationships with all the providers, 
if a if we go to do a map update and a provider has not participated or uh, doesn't have the resources to prepare certain information, um, we may have to rely on the 477 data as a starting point for that provider. And then with the engineering work we do in the field, the feedback we receive from residents, we'll work and refine that data to make it more granular and have more confidence in the way it's shown on the map uh, for uh, successive iterations. Uh, just another example, we also have interactive maps available. So um, this one, again, is available for Texas, where you can type in an address um, and immediately zoom to that location and see a list of the providers that are potentially offering service, what technologies they're offered on, uh, and the speeds that are available as well. Uh, several analysis layers are also put together for, for various states and, and uh, communities as well. So this example is showing the density of the broadband providers at a specific speed, in this case, 25 meg down by three meg up, which is the current federal definition of broadband. Um, and certainly that even becomes um, a little bit subjective in terms of different states have set separate goals. Um, for instance, we'll talk about, I'll show a couple examples from Minnesota and they've actually increased what their minimum definition of broadband is. They actually call 100 meg down by 20 meg up. That is their definition of broadband. And so um, 25 by three has not been uh, sufficient enough. So they have actually increased that. But uh, in this example for Texas, uh, the darker the color, the higher number of providers that are available in a given area at that speed. Um, and so several different analysis layers uh, once we do collect that information on where broadband services are available so that we can look at the level of competition, uh, where are there served and more importantly unserved areas that need that focus and attention um, and possible funding to try and expand broadband services to get everybody connected. A uh, couple other examples here from Michigan. Um, so while the previous slides were focused on broadband service areas, uh, this next example is showing where vertical assets are. And so we had a project in Northeast Michigan where they wanted to look at where are all the vertical assets in their region. So anything from uh, towers, uh, tall buildings, silos, water tanks, um, any tall asset that could potentially be used for broadband access. Um, so we tracked all that. We have an interactive map available for the community to use so that when they compare the unserved areas to these vertical asset locations, then they have a better idea of where are these assets already in place that they might be able to install equipment on and broadcast that to the area around it, um, get those people connected somehow. Um, and so there's been a few projects like this where the vertical assets have been tracked, um, putting together a single database, um, looking at who owns that tower or water tank so they know who to contact. Does it already have power? Does it already have internet access? Um, because that's gonna take a lot less work and get people connected a lot quicker than if they're gonna install and construct a brand new tower. You need to do environmental impact studies. There's a lot of permitting and things that have to take place. So if they can start with assets that already exist, they're already, they're past square one already. Uh, another example from Michigan is looking at uh, Wi-Fi hotspots. Uh, when the pandemic first started, uh, the state of Michigan wanted to put together uh, a map of where people can go and connect to either free Wi-Fi or any available Wi-Fi. Uh, so we created an application. It's a light application. So if somebody's got a mobile device they would be checking for the nearest location on or a satellite connection that might be kind of slow. Um, they would still be able to use this application to find where a faster internet on a Wi-Fi connection might be available, even if that was at the time, you know, certainly in a parking lot. Um, unfortunately, that was one of the big stories that came out early in the pandemic was students that didn't have home internet that were going to parking lots and library parking lots and to their schools and fast food places just to use the Wi-Fi from the cars. Um, so this app was created for that purpose. Uh, like I mentioned, Minnesota has had a, uh, a broadband mapping program for over a decade now, and they've also got a state-based grant program. So uh, a couple examples here, they have providers 
where, who actually apply every year for funding to expand into unserved areas. And so that's based on the data that's been collected and refined and validated. And so the map on the right is showing the location of uh, very generalized, certainly since it's point data, but where have projects been awarded? And uh, there's actually a second page to this that actually lists them by name by year to show where funds have gone into unserved and underserved areas. And then as part of that, the map on the left, we're actually tracking where that build out occurs using those state funds. Um, so there's another layer of transparency there. And then we actually have our field engineers that before a final payment is made to a provider, we actually confirm that the areas that they said they were gonna build out to and have confirmed they're actually built out to and those people can now get connected somehow. Uh, just a couple more state examples. Um, this one's from Iowa. This is a, a project that we had earlier this year. Uh, the different colors are showing the different technology types. So as we are collecting information from broadband providers, um, doing some coverage estimating, estimations, uh, validating that service, we put together a broadband map to show where is service across the state of Iowa. Um, another interesting fact about Iowa, they actually have one of the highest number of broadband providers in their state. They have 200 different broadband providers. Um, so certainly that's a lot of outreach, a lot of data to collect and process. Um, but it's very interesting because for a geographically smaller state, they actually have more broadband providers than the state of Texas. Um, and so very interesting uh, dynamic there with the state. Um, and so as part of that project, uh, the state also had a grant program similar to Minnesota, where they wanted to look at the unserved areas and then put funds towards those areas that don't actually have broadband access. So on this map, uh, what we're looking at, the, the maroonish color at the bottom there, that is showing all of the detailed unserved areas in the state at 25 by three speeds. And then on top of that, the state, as part of their uh, administrative, administrative rules for their grant program, any census block that was at least 90% unserved by broadband was considered eligible for these grant funds. Um, and so being able to put that type of data together, publish it, and so providers could look at the map, see which census blocks they wanted to apply for. Um, the state also had a challenge process so that if once the initial map was published, if somebody got out on the map and said, oh, nope, this area is actually not served or this is understated, uh, they were able to file that information to make the map more accurate before the final grant program um, areas are awarded. And then uh, last state example, um, looking at Kansas, uh, this one is actually on the mobile side, so cellular coverage. Um, a few years ago, the FCC had uh, launched a, uh, a subsidy for mobility service. And uh, when they first released the areas that were going to be eligible for this, almost the entire state of Kansas was listed as ineligible. Um, the FCC believed based on previous filings that essentially the entire state had 4G LTE service. And that caused quite an uproar because there were a lot of areas where the state and the local farm bureau and other residents said, you know, hey, we, we do not have service here. It doesn't matter what, what phone or what service I use, I've, I don't have it. Um, and so we did a series of uh, mobile drive testing throughout the state uh, in different select and targeted locations. And so this map showing here, you can kind of see some of the, the aqua or turquoise lines showing our drive tracks and then the results of the test in either green or red. Uh, green showing where that minimum download speed was, uh, was hit on that mobile service and the red showing where all the fails were or the areas where the connection wasn't even enough to run a speed test. Um, and so the results of that um, on the right showing the different areas that were targeted um, and where we were showing there were a series of fails on all reported providers within that, that grid. Um, and so the state was able to supply this information to the FCC to show how not, <laughs> how eligible some of those areas should have been for that program. Uh, now I want to get into a little bit about some of the advocacy and legislative actions um, because there are so many different federal and state-based opportunities that are currently underway. Um, at the FCC, 
itself, they have various subsidy programs where they are actually uh, providing funds to providers to expand services into unserved areas. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, certainly as, you know, internet has expanded since it first really started branching out, uh, you know, a lot of these are private companies. And so there has to be a business case for the expansion of broadband into some areas. So certainly more densely populated, you're gonna have a lot more customers in a lot smaller area. You're gonna get your ROI. But then in more rural areas, you've got certainly a lot more sparsely populated. You have driveways that are well off of the road. Um, so you're gonna need a lot more infrastructure for a lot less customers. Um, and so what the FCC programs really strive to do is to provide a subsidy to help offset those costs. And so these are a list of some of those programs that exist. Uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture also has some programs available, uh, different loans and grants or half and half with the ReConnect program is also available. And then um, some state actions, I'm going to go ahead, uh, go down to this third one here. Uh, so Michigan, Minnesota that we've talked about, Tennessee also has a broadband accessibility grant program. Um, actually had a couple of engineers in Tennessee over the past couple of weeks validating uh, some new expansion areas that providers have built out to. Um, and so the state of Tennessee also has a grant program where they're working on expanding broadband access across the state. Um, Iowa, we talked about that one, showed some of those eligible areas. Um, some states have broadband task forces where they're actually working together, different uh, people from different industries across the state working together to champion broadband ex expansion activities. Uh, and then we have at the local level some broadband feasibility studies. Um, so as we've looked at different maps with different types of infrastructure on them, uh, some communities want a little bit more information. Where are the infrastructure routes in the ground? Where are those assets that already exist so that they know, you know, based on what's currently available, are they able to expand off of the already existing network and infrastructure or are there areas that are really starting at square one? There's no service and there's no infrastructure to even start from. Um, so that helps to identify based on the community, the people that are there, the infrastructure that already exists, the topography, what might be the best solution uh, for them to proceed with. And then of course, all of those opportunities require good data because you need to be able to make those decisions on the, that location-based part to know where to expand and where to focus that energy and those funds. Um, so one of the programs that was mentioned on the previous slide is the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund or RDOF. And that was actually just announced last week, the results of the auction. Um, and so the FCC held that um, leading up through Thanksgiving and providers actually got to bid on unserved areas to get funding. And so the results of this are now published um, to show which areas had a winning bidder. And so now providers will be uh, working to expand access into those areas over the, the next six years and it supplies 10 years worth of funding, but they have to build out within six. So trying to um, make sure people are getting connected faster because it does take quite a while in some areas, certainly. Um, so it talked at the beginning about the FCC Form 477 data and some of the um, in insufficiencies that exist with that. And so the FCC and Congress have been working to figure out what is the best way to, to remedy that. How can we get better data, more granular data, ensure its accuracy? And so this past March, Congress passed the Broadband Data Act or the Deployment Accuracy and Technological Availability Act. Um, so broadband data, uh, so that data act is now in play. However, it has not been funded. Um, so that is still in progress, but the terms of the law itself um, the FCC has already been working on technical parameters. What does that look like? Um, essentially, it's going to get to a point where the FCC can hopefully retire the Form 477 and replace it with this new data collection. Um, it's also called the Digital Opportunity Data Collection or DODC. And that will be where we're actually um, getting uh, shape files and other geospatial data on broadband service areas from providers that get filed, there's resident feedback, there's engineering on the ground, 
Um, there's also an address data set component that's going to be overlaid so you can literally find exactly what locations do and do not have broadband and which locations need those subsidies. Um, and so, as I said, unfortunately, it hasn't been funded yet, but it sounds like that is coming pretty soon. It has been made a very high priority um, at the congressional level, bipartisan support, certainly, because we need to get more Americans connected to the internet to, to be successful and to not, uh, not have any you know, students or anybody left behind there. So uh, just to wrap up, a few uh, additional programs that are in the works or already available just in terms of looking at broadband expansion and its related technologies. Um, so um, I'm certainly in the GIS department and, and working with the engineering and technical services, we focus a lot on broadband mapping and what are those data visualization products that we can put out there so that people understand what their broadband system looks like. Uh, so one of these other programs is focused on community engagement. Um, so perhaps not at a state level, but perhaps uh, if there are some counties or communities that need a little bit more assistance on figuring out what their systems look like, what's that infrastructure in the ground or in the air, and how can they use that? Where are they at technology-wise? Where do they want to be? And what are the solutions that can help them get there? So if they're interested in something like attracting a data center or a large employer, what are the things that they need to take into account to be able to accomplish those goals? And so that's part of what the, the Connected Community Engagement Program does. As part of that, um, one of the things that we're showing on the map here is a results of surveys. So we do residential and business level surveys that ask a series of questions about internet and broadband and technology use at home or at the business uh, and then post those results as well. So. Um, this example, just looking at, do you have broad, do you have internet service at home? Yes or no? Um, what type is it? Are your needs met by your current internet access? Um, different things like that so we can really pinpoint where the need is. Uh, another option available is for education assessments, um, looking at what services schools and school districts have available to them, how much are they paying for it? Um, because if a district can perhaps have a coalition with other neighboring districts to bring a provider to them. They might have more success than a smaller district would on their own. So we have, uh, we're trying to help schools and school districts with that as well. Um, and then looking at other types of assessments, what kind of systems and applications are they using in the school um, so that they've got better internet access for their students and for their teachers and learning opportunities. Another aspect is uh, telehealth, like we mentioned, um, trying to piece together uh, not just where services are and are not available, but how do people react to those services? So they may have internet access, but are they using it for telehealth activities? If they're not, do is it because they don't have internet or is it because they have concerns about privacy, cybersecurity? Uh, what are those things that per, uh, health providers need to take into account as well? Uh, and then the last uh, program I'll mention is on digital literacy and job placement. Um, so originally when this program first started about seven or eight years ago, uh, it was really looking at uh, towns and communities where perhaps the, the large, the major employer of the town, perhaps it was a steel mill that closed down and now you've got a, a large portion of your population that did not have work and had perhaps not been trained in various digital uh, literacies. And so uh, the Digital Works program really started by uh, addressing that, providing learning opportunities, providing digital skills and the job placement to do work from home, uh, making sure that if people wanted to stay in their rural small community, they could still do that even with a decrease in the number of physical jobs there in the community. They now had an opportunity to get that digital learning to have, have it be certified um, and then be able to immediately get job placement assistance. Um, that has migrated a little bit. Um, so our digital works program, we actually just launched at Fort Campbell to help with uh, veterans and military spouses. Um, before the pandemic hit, military spouses had the highest level of unemployment in the country. And so certainly as you're going from base to base or you get deployed, you, if you are a military spouse, that job, you would like to have it go with you because otherwise you might not get hired if a, an employer knows that, well, that person's gonna get transferred to a different base 
in a little bit, I don't, I may not want to take a risk on them. So the digital works Fort Campbell, and it's actually, we're trying to work with other um, local military communities as well, gets the training and the job placement available. So the job can travel, travel with them. So as they move base to base, they don't have to start over with a new house, new school, and a new job. That job can go with them and be flexible for what they need. Um, so digital works is really looking at, you know, my group is focused on, you know, where, where is that service available? How can we expand? Um, and then digital works focuses on making sure people have access and don't have the barriers that may exist to actually using internet at home and having a job that may be available to them. So with that, I'll definitely open it up for any questions anybody may have on um, any aspect of that, the broadband mapping, the data, uh, moving forward to getting better data available across the country. Um, but thank you so much for having me and uh, Michelle and, and Robert, I'll take any questions you guys might have. Thanks, Ashley. So if anybody has a question, please feel free to either unmute yourself or type in the chat. We have about 10 minutes left. Well, I, I have a few questions if nobody else is gonna ask any. Um, so I know you talked a little bit about how the FCC data gets used, but does Connected Nation partner with the FCC at all to show them the data that they have for the, like the actual networks or is that the provider's job to s submit that to the FCC? Um, it's a little bit of uh, kind of all around actually. So we've, we have met with the FCC on multiple occasions to show kind of what we've seen on the ground and working with providers uh, to show kind of some of the discrepancies that may exist in the data. Um, and then we've also assisted providers with their filing to make sure that they're more accurate because certainly they don't want to be overbuilt by another provider that's gonna get funded to serve their area. So they wanna make sure that their data is accurate. So we have helped um, a handful of providers make sure that their filings are accurate as well. And another one, this isn't really a question. I, I was going to ask this if, you know, there was any work going on in Tennessee, but you answered that. Um, but a good place to look, if you're not looking here already, is Millington, Tennessee, Atoka, Tennessee, and Munford, Tennessee, because the internet here is horrible. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I know the, um, the Tennessee Economic and Community Development um, Department um, at the state level, they are working very closely with reviewing the, the FCC data that's available for the state um, and then confirming and, and accepting those kind of challenges. So I know they're definitely open for feedback on uh, where services perhaps aren't available that are reported as served. And then the opposite, perhaps there are areas that are marked as unserved, but there actually is a provider there. Perhaps it's a small provider or a new provider. Um, so I know they're, they're definitely very concerned about making sure that information is accurate because they're giving out state funds to make sure that more areas get covered. Does anyone else have any questions? I don't know if I really have a question so much as just a, a little anecdote. I know you know, I work for a, a, a county in North Mississippi, just outside of Memphis, DeSoto County. And our board of supervisors had us do this crowdsourced broadband survey where we did a survey one, two, three thing and put it on our website and got all these people, like maybe about 2000 people to fill out the survey indicating what type of internet they thought they had available. And then we mapped that and they were going to submit that to some, I'm not sure who was asking the board for this data, but we put together this interactive map where, and it was, you know, it was probably pretty fudged. Um, but I guess what, um, you know, I guess I'm just kind of curious what we really should have been doing instead of the way we did it, because I, I don't have a lot of confidence in what we did. Uh, well, and that's, that's, I guess that's one of the reasons why we kind of look at um, a, we try to get as a holistic approach as possible in terms of working directly with the providers, uh, getting that crowdsourced information, uh, doing the engineering studies, and then also some independent research. Um, 
with the, the crowdsourced information, we have found that there can be just awareness issues. Um, so uh, looking at, you know, if somebody says, oh, I don't, I don't have internet, but perhaps there is a small fixed wireless provider that doesn't have a huge marketing presence, but is actually serving their area, they just may not have heard about it. Um, so that's why we try to get another layer of confirmation when we do receive feedback. If somebody says, you know, oh, hey, I don't have service, we try to make sure, you know, oh, hey, it looks like, have you tried these providers? It looks like this one may be available. And then we'll go and edit the data as well. Um, and then there's also an education part to just the equipment that's in your house. Um, so if you're, if you constantly feel like things are dropping in terms of your service availability, or you're not getting the speeds that you thought you were, um, there is a level of education there because if you've got, like, for instance, I've got cable at my house, and then I've got a Wi-Fi network set up. Um, so depending on the type of router that I have, you know, one one router, one Wi-Fi network basically gives me the same type of speed as if I'm hardwired into the internet from my computer. And then one of my Wi-Fi networks is quite a bit slower and that's on purpose. But if I'm taking a speed test from my slower network and going, oh, my provider is not giving me the speed that I asked for, well, that, that speed test isn't actually representative of that your physical network service. Um, and then also looking at equipment like your router and your modem, if you have that type of setup, um, how old is your equipment and making sure that people know that, you know, that equipment does expire, uh, not like milk expire, but certainly it, it <laughs> shelf life in terms of being able to keep up with the new network systems and the speeds that are available. Um, so definitely a lot on the education side, making sure that um, you know, if there are issues with somebody's network, there are you know, speed tests that they can take, there's equipment checks that they can do, um, you know, and, and other things that if they do have internet that they can look at, and then if they don't have internet that they can file that information, like what you guys did, you did the survey to collect that information on what is their perspective, uh, what's their impression of their current connection or internet, and what do they think they, what do they think they have and what do they think they're supposed to have. Well, so Scott has okay. a question in the chat. Scott, do you want to unmute okay. yourself? Okay, yeah, I couldn't unmute myself. I'm driving, so I can't. I wanted to listen to the presentation, but I couldn't uh, unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. <laughs> No, I was just going to let you know, Rob, I didn't pass it on, but uh, three days ago, the state of Mississippi just received a grant from the FCC and the federal government for $497.5 million to expand broadband throughout the state of Mississippi. It's a very, very neat initiative that they're doing, and they're actually working through the co-ops to help provide the service, and a lot of the electric co-ops in the state have never provided that kind of service before but they already have electric lines in the ground. They already have right-of-ways and stuff. So I'm helping several of the co-ops in the state of Mississippi expand into um, broadband. So I just, just to let you know. Yeah, I saw that in the newspaper. That was good news. Sounds like Mississippi did really well on that. All right, guys. So I'm going to go ahead and pull the winner for this ArcGIS for personal use license. and. Uh, so I didn't put some some people are here that won last time, so I did not put them in the entry pool. Um, so Clifton Phillips has won the ArcGIS for personal use license. And Clifton, we already have your email, so I can email that to you and, and email you the instructions for how to download that. And it will have to be downloaded before January. I don't remember the exact date, but it does expire in January. I think it's actually January 11th, so let, let me get on that. Um, hey, I just have one more quick announcement um, for attendees. Um, we are going to, this is uh, something we haven't done for any of the webinars yet, but we are going to start, um, now that we're doing the registration before the webinar, we're going to start doing attendance certificates that could be useful for your portfolio if you're working on GISP, or just, you know, if you just need to have CEU type or professional development credits. So um, hope, the idea is that this could um, count towards those type of credentials. So just look for that in your email. Thank you so much Anybody? for being here.
Ashley and, and giving this great presentation. It was very eye-opening. And yeah, ab absolutely. Thank you. And, uh, and I'll send you the, um, the presentation slides as well if, if you want to send those out to the attendees as well. Great. Thanks. Okay. And Ashley, we also um, usually uh, the, take the recording from these and, and post it to our YouTube channel. Is that good for you? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, well, again, Ashley, thank you so much. That was a really good presentation. And as uh, I saw in the chat, um, very timely. This is a, an issue that's been on a lot of our minds and uh, a lot of our lawmakers' minds, and it's been all over the newspapers. So it's uh, good for us to um, try to get up to speed on this. So again, thank you so much for your time today. And thanks you all for attending. If, the, if nobody else has any other questions, let me check the chat real quick. Looks uh, like it's all. Congratulations, Cliff. So with that, congratulations, Cliff. And we will see y'all in January. Everybody have a very Merry Christmas. Get your Christmas shopping done. And uh, Happy New Year. Thank all you. All right, y'all. Have Everybody. a good one. Bye now.